Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 8th, 2011, and my guest is Robert Townsend, the Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics at MIT. His latest book is Financial Systems in Developing Economies, Growth Inequality and Policy Evaluation in Thailand. Rob, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Very glad to talk with you. In recent years, there's been tremendous economic changes in the world at large, particularly in Asia. And by recent years, I mean, I mean the last two or three decades. What are some of the stylized facts of that experience? What do we know about what's happened uh, in terms of growth and development, and, and particularly in Asia? Well, of course, the most remarkable thing now is the is the uh, growing presence of India and and especially China with with very very high rates of growth. Even if you think they're exaggerated a bit, or the statistics are somewhat unreliable, there's no clear they're growing by leaps and and bounds. And that's uh, the sequel to you know the earlier very high growth rates that we saw in Japan and Korea and uh, Singapore and so on. Why do we think Asia is growing so dramatically relative to other poor areas of the world? Uh, Latin America and Africa in particular have not matched that pace, and in particular Africa has, has been relatively stagnant compared to the other two. What do we know about what's going on there? Yes, these are the the big mysteries. Uh, actually, Latin America, if you go back in its history uh, to the um, before, say the early '80s, they also had similarly high growth rates, but they didn't persist. Uh, Mexico and other countries sort of uh, basically stagnated a bit. Mexico will grow. Uh, and then have a financial crisis and take, you know, it's almost one step forward, two steps back. Uh, and there are a lot of people trying to figure out the causes of, of this. Uh, many people have prior beliefs about its the financial system, its politics, its its education, uh, unfortunately, these pieces just don't come together very well. People don't consider a variety of hypotheses, and uh, unlike, say, some of the work we may chat about it in a few minutes. Is it a fool's game trying to answer those questions? In particular, you know, we all have – most of us have those prior beliefs. Um, confirmation bias is a big problem. What role do you think – statistical analysis is ultimately going to play in trying to answer those questions. Obviously, people try to use it. They try to answer the questions. They try to hold things constant and look at the effects of one variable or another. But I wouldn't say any consensus has emerged. Do you think there's – is that correct? And is there any hope of that happening? Oh, I, I think it's correct on both counts. There is no consensus, but i firmly convinced that we can get to the bottom of it. What's the evidence for that confidence? Well, it's a bit self-serving, but uh, myself and some other people have been basically combining, you know, various fields together, both uh, micro and macro, to try to uh, to get all the pieces. My my own view is one has to dig uh, pretty deep down and get existing data, or even do one's own surveys and really look at households and and small, medium-sized firms and see, uh, distinguish among them which are somewhat successful, which are less successful, try to get at the constraints. Once we're at constraints or obstacles and also how some households and firms overcome those obstacles, then one can extrapolate. Um, so you... In my view, start with the uh, 
the uh, micro data, obviously not ignoring the environment and the macro climate, but you start with the micro data and build up from there. I know you've been doing that in Thailand. We're, we will get to that, but let's let's stick with the big picture for now. Um, there's a big debate in the literature. One issue we've, we've just been talking about is the causes of growth or the causes of stagnation. Um, there's another big debate going on about inequality and, and its relationship to growth. Uh, what's our uh, what's our knowledge there? That's. Um I think there's a bit more of a consensus. There are controversies about Kuznets curves and, you know, whether it's inevitable that inequality will go up and then go down the way Kuznets had described. I think there's pretty much agreement that we don't have to experience Kuznets curves and rising periods of inequality are not inevitable. Um, but the end, related, people have been doing decompositions of the sources of changes of, of inequality into, say, occupation transitions or education or access to the financial system. And we're, we're much more able to quantify now what's big or, or what's small in those, in those numbers. It's not a, a proof, but it's, it kind of tells you where to start looking to understand the sources of, of changes in inequality. Of course, one of the challenges in this kind of work is the quality of data and some of the barriers to, to even the best efforts. A lot of the transition we're talking about is going from an agricultural society to a more, say, manufacturing-based or ultimately information-based, and we don't have very good data on income in, in agricultural economies, I assume, um, well, it depends on the country. Um, some countries have been fielding socioeconomic surveys, fairly large cross-sectional surveys. They're not panels. They don't necessarily survey the same households or the same firms year after year, but the sample size is large. And if you're lucky, depending on the country, those uh, data go way back uh, this is true, for example, of Mexico. Been gav Mexico from various ministries have been uh, there. There's quite a few sources of of data one can use. But yes, obviously, in other countries, these surveys are not necessarily of high quality and and not nearly so comprehensive. I mean, for example, the irony: um, Korea, South Korea, that we know. Is, quite successful for decades, um, doesn't have uh, detailed household surveys until relatively recently. So we can't go back deep into that history and really understand how the markets institutions uh, were evolving, and we don't have firm documentation of the uh, household by household of the transition from poor agriculture to this, you know, 10th largest manufacturing uh, country. Uh, uh, but anyway, I'm just echoing the point that sometimes you do have data and sometimes you don't. I, got, I was thinking more of the fact that household production in a rural agricultural setting, household production, that is stuff that isn't brought to market, is going to be hard to measure and therefore it might be very hard to get a feel for what actual growth really is, or inequality, for that matter. Some uh, institutions, such as the World Bank, uh, began these living standard measurement surveys, uh, both internally within the bank and advised by some some very good uh, uh, academic uh, advisors, um, and they have pretty extensive. Co uh, set of questions directed at household production. Um, it is quite true what you're saying that the conception of households in the national income accounts uh, would be as suppliers of labor and savings, uh, uh, suppliers of factors of production, and in turn the demanders of, of consumer goods. Uh, and uh, And that's definitely inappropriate for developing economies where so much of the production is done uh, 
by the households themselves. Uh, can, uh, could things be better? Yes, for sure. Ideally, one would be collecting the survey data, sort of aware uh, not only that households are producers, but also collecting it in a way that's consistent with uh, you know, national income statistics, so we could get a better measure of what's going on in the household and the extent to which that household production is contributing to national income. It's, it's a tricky problem even in a developed country when you have, say, in the United States, last half of the 20th century, re revolutionary increases in, say, women's labor force participation, particularly women with children. Um, and you also have changes going the other direction with men's labor force participation going down not as dramatically. But, you know, it's very hard. We take someone who's not working. We call them a zero. Uh, we don't put them in the sample. And they get a job. Suddenly they're in the sample. And so it's, I think, quite tricky to analyze what happens to the median in, in, those, um, in those data sets. We, we feel like, well, the median's better than the mean because the median isn't distorted by outliers, but the median has its own problems when, when there's big changes in the size of the – pool and the people that we're pulling in were, were artificially classified as zero before. Oh, absolutely. I, 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 re I think of that in my mind as sort of transitions on the extensive margin. You just gave a, a, great, a good example of individuals engaged in home production or at least, you know, working at home who then go uh, and make a transition to the market. Uh, Kuznets, um, I find it a bit surprising, but the original conception of the national income accounts was to measure market activity, not all production. Sure. But we often refer to national income and national product as if it were inclusive. Right. Uh, well, yeah, we so, would... So I think the national income accounts are, uh, it is a bit treacherous, uh, depending on the data you're using. But again... If we have, especially, I think, if we have panel data and we can track uh, what's going on in the household over time, then you can actually measure these transitions. Not, you know, not to mention that it's not like necessarily in the house uh, with housework uh, mixed in with with some leisure. This these, this is production on the farm or or in the household business yeah. uh, done in the village. So, it, you know, depending on how much they're eating of their own product, it, it may not show up as I think it ought to if it were done correctly in the in household uh, income and national product. Yeah, I mention it because a recent uh, program we did with Tyler Cowan and his book, The Great Stagnation, I push the claim that in the United States, when people are talking about growing inequality or median income stagnation or slow growth, uh, one of the challenges of interpreting those data correctly is that there have been a lot of changes demographically in the United States over the last four decades, huge increase in divorce rate, um, big increase in the number of households as a result so that when we're looking at changes in mobility or quintiles, um, snapshots give a very different picture compared to panel data. So I totally agree with you that panel data is extremely important. We don't have very much of it here in the United States. We have some. And by, for those listening, you know, panel data, by panel data, we mean you go to the same household year after year after year, and you ask them the same ideally, or at least some of the same questions. You may add questions or drop them from time to time, but the core questions you care about, you're watching their progress, not the medians, comparing medians across time uh, which is a very different statistical animal. Oh, yes, I, I very much agree. The U.S. has Panel Study of Income Dynamics, PSID, yep. uh, and for many purposes, it's uh, almost, the almost you know only data set around. There are other exceptions as well, but then even within it, it's great that they do it. Uh, it's funded by the National Science Foundation and um, and hopefully it will continue to go on. But depending on the year, they ask relatively few questions about consumption, for example. Yeah. So you don't really uh, you don't really have the measures that you would like to have. So you have to get creative and uh, 
combine, say, the PSID with the Consumer Expenditure Survey, which yeah. is largely a cross-section. Well, not quite, because households rotate in and stay there for two, three quarters, and then they're rotated out again. Uh, but people have been sort of splicing or interpolating those two data sets together to be able to get uh, impute or more accurately assess, say, something like consumption, which is mel- well measured in the consumer expenditure survey onto the PSID so we can exploit the panel. Yeah, no, that's very important work. Um, I, again, I only make the observation that the um, the PSID, the panel study of income dynamics, gives a very different picture of the last 30 or 40 years compared to the um, economy as a whole measured by, say, the median. Um, well, doesn't, that's doesn't have the have sampling issues. Um, that's correct. The good news with the PSID is they do try to track spin-off households as, say, yep. the kids leave and set up their own uh, farm, uh, family. But, and divorce. Uh, but then again, you know, one might want to sort of periodically, you know, reassess the sample and make sure we're we're sampling adequately to yep. to pick up changing situations and trends in the economy. I, I can't help but say that it would be really great if the U.S. were doing more of this. Um, we can talk in a minute maybe about my work in Thailand, but if I've been actually contacted by the Federal Reserve you know, like, what would it take to field uh, a panel in the U.S. instigated by, uh, motivated by the the recent, you know, financial crisis we've had in the U.S. So hindsight is great. You never know for sure if you would have seen it coming. But if we had been tracking some of those households and in houses and their mortgages and so on, we might have done a little better. Yeah, Personally, I would like to see the Federal Reserve get less involved in the systemic financial risk, but I know that's not the trend. Um, well, I'm, I'm not taking a policy no, stand. I, I know you're not. No, I know you're not. I just find it interesting that they'd want to, they're interested potentially in that kind of research, um, which I view as further example of mission creep on their part. Let, let's talk about the financial system generally in, in developing countries. Um, why is it important? When is it uh a serious barrier to development, and uh, what do we understand about that? The, um, you know, snapshot pictures of the, say, existing financial institutions in a, in a developing country uh, provide, at best, a, a distorted picture. If you look at a country like Thailand or other countries, by number of branches or balance sheets or, uh, you know, funds mobilized and so on, it would look like commercial banks are uh, large and a big part of the picture. But if you go into rural areas, at least, and actually in and in cities as well, depending on who you're, who you're sampling, uh, commercial banks are often nowhere in sight. And so... Um, then on the other hand, you, you would see, say, some specialty institutions, uh, government banks that still exist in many of these countries, uh, that are devoted to savings mobilization or to lending to agriculture. They start to become the large players, at least, you know, formal financial institutions. And then, uh, they are actually rivaled by this massive informal market that exists out there with not just stereotypical money lenders, but also family, friends, uh, borrowing and lending or, or giving gifts and sending remittances. Those financial transactions are just huge. They're typically small. You wouldn't think it would mount up to much, but it often is as big or bigger than the measured transactions in the formal financial sector. You can think about the challenges a little bit if you think about the United States, which most people would say has a highly developed – I think anybody would argue that it has a highly developed financial system, right? So on the surface, uh, it's a very highly developed system. But there are parts of the United States where there's no commercial bank anywhere in sight, as, as the example you just gave, and where uh, payday loans are common – uh, very high rates of interest uh, and an informal 
networks, of course, uh, with people lending money at, at very high rates, again, very high rates of interest. So how do we assess, if we can at all, uh, how developed a, a nation's financial system is? is? Is that the wrong question? I look at outcomes. Uh, you know, I look directly, first of all, at the at the consequences of uh, the financial system, not taking a stand on whether it's good or bad. Let's look, for example, at consumption again and see what happens to a household when they they have adverse shocks and, and income is, is quite low through unemployment or sickness or any number of uh, unfortunate events. If... Uh, if consumption drops as income drops, then indeed we've documented that they're vulnerable. Uh, on the other hand, it could well be they have ways of stabilizing consumption, uh, and consumption is largely immune to these large idiosyncratic income fluctuations. Positive or negative. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, positive or negative. So if you got an income, a bonus, an unexpected right. bonus... Uh, yeah, you want to smooth off the peaks and fill in the valleys. Well, is that – let me ask you about that. Milton Friedman, in his theory of the consumption function, uh, made that argument, right? And it is largely borne out, I think, by data, in, certainly in the United States. Uh, it comes up in policy discussions because temporary tax rebates tend to get saved rather than spent. Um, I remember when um, when Friedman – uh, won the Nobel Prize. Someone uh, asked him about how an unexpected windfall like this would affect his consumption, given his own theoretical work on it and empirical work. And ever the wit, uh, Milton replied, "Well, who said it was unexpected?" Um, with meaning that his life, he was being, you know, facetious in part, but also in part, if if you do expect. A, a gain in the future, you might start to spend it along the way. You wouldn't necessarily go wild um, when you receive the money uh, and, and spend it all. You'd, you'd add it to your wealth, and your Friedman's argument was, you would, as you said, you would smooth your consumption. But how much of that is is just a theory versus what people actually do versus what's desirable? How much of it's cultural? So when you're in a place like Thailand on the ground, what do we learn about how people feel about those kind of changes? Well, let me draw agree and yet draw a distinction. Friedman was talking about smoothing over time, sort of thinking about the permanent income hypothesis. Uh, and yes, that does assume there's a way to to uh, smooth off the peaks and fill in, fill in the valleys through, say, borrowing and lending and so on. Uh, I'm actually adding to that the idea of insurance across people at a point in time. Uh, if you had Friedman's world, there would be a lot of smoothing going on, but you wouldn't see a wave-like picture where uh, consumption is, say, moving up and down together. Smooth, yes, but not not coincident across the households. What what insurance adds is the capability of uh, basically through remittances, gifts, and so on, providing money to the unlucky poor at that moment uh, away from the lucky rich. I, I want to say lucky and unlucky in the sense that I'm not arguing for equality. I'm not taking a stand that, we, that efficiency means an egalitarian system. You can have long-run, persistent differences across households in terms of their levels. So I'm sort of renormalizing against their long run average, and then arguing that on top of that we could have we could have these insurance like systems. But to get to the answer to your question, um, I did this in India in, a, in an article in Econometrica called "Risk and Insurance in Village India," which showed that for the most part, with some exceptions. Households in a village were doing remarkably well at achieving this efficiency standard. It really raised a, a, a controversy because there were presumptions by policymakers and others that these Indian households near 
or, or below poverty would not be able to help themselves and organize among themselves in a way that I seem to be uh, finding. Um, so I, I then, uh, and, and there is an exception, and I should say it right away, that is to say the relatively uh, poor, the poorest among the poor, and those, say, with wage earnings as opposed to engage in agriculture, actually were somewhat vulnerable, but not anywhere near 70 cents on the dollar converted into rupees, but rather in the order of maybe uh, 20 cents on the dollar, every dollar of income fluctuation making its way into 20 cents worth of, of fluctuations in consumption. Yeah, that's that's pretty remarkable, and of course... It's um, a different economic system than than the, in the developed world, right? I assume what what were typically is there an t- answer to what what was the typical source of income for the for the people who were poor? Well, they're they're really quite diversified. Typically, some earning wages by working in the village or or outside of it. Some are tapping palm trees and making toddy liquor. Some are. Uh, rearing uh, livestock bullocks that are used for plowing, uh, or even some running stores and small businesses. So, uh, and that's pretty typical. It's not just sort of one homogeneous world out there. There's there's plenty of differences both in average levels of income and the sources of income. And yet somehow they're pooling all of that together as if they were in. An implicit mutual fund, and uh, and sort of eating the the dividends. Now, one aspect you know, I, I derailed you from your your starting point. Your starting point was that you don't look at the necessarily at the particular institutions, but the outcomes. And you're talking now about the potential to smooth either through organized financial transactions or these informal methods of of assistance from family and friends or even some agreements I assume that they might literally have but that are just private agreements that we don't normally think of as financial institutions. But those are those are outcomes that make life more pleasant, right? So you know, your, your shop loses business, you get hurt and you can't do your job, so you get laid off or fired. Um, the bullocks get, on, get sick and you can't raise them. They get – you can't get any income from them. So bad things happen, bad luck outside of anyone's individual control. And having some sort of financial system to smooth consumption is important. But that's about sort of what I would think of as your well-being over time for a given level of productivity. What role does the financial system play in getting you out of the rut you're in if you're very poor? Uh, how important is it that there are financial institutions – or a better way to ask it, maybe what outcome measures would you want to look at to talk about whether those systems are working well for growth, not just dealing with a particular level of, say, average income? Oh, yes, absolutely. So one of the big findings, and one might say puzzles, is that the system doesn't work nearly so well for these longer-run investment uh, possibilities. I mean, to some degree, it was. It does. For example, if we come back to the the idea of transient shocks and smoothing, um, you you would like a system where households are not sensitive to cash flow in in terms of the timing and the magnitude of investment. Uh, and so, just like consumption, some of these households in some villages can do quite quite well uh, pooling. Uh, resources, but if you draw back from that, as you were asking me, and look at the big picture, uh, how are they doing over the longer term? One measure would be what financial analysts use: uh, the return on assets, yep. <clears throat> which is simply income or net profits divided by productive assets. And there's a tremendous. Uh, variation over households in in that number. Uh, On the high end, the rates of return are so large as to raise doubts, at least among uh, people who who have not studied developing economies. You can have real rates of return uh, 
that are in the order of uh, 40%, 50% per year, uh, which, of course, begs the, the, the issue or the question you're raising, which is if such households exist out there, surely there would be investors getting them the money. But the answer seems to be, by and large, no. It's not happening much. Um, and the other end of it is there are households who are running businesses and farms with relatively low rates of return. And so, again, if things were working better, you would expect these households to exit what they're doing and do something else with their labor and, and their resources. But by and large, that happens slowly, uh, if at all. So this is symptomatic of a poorly functioning financial system. Um, now, it's interesting that in that context, you will see by accident or design some financial innovations. Uh, in Thailand, for example, the uh, previous government established a, a local savings and loan for every single village in the country by seeding it with a grant um, from which, like rotating credit, essentially, or uh, other financial institutions, they're capitalized by outside government sources as a gift, but then th those become the, the village resources, and they set up a committee to, to lend and to recover loans and so on. Uh, ironically, the same amount of money was put in every village, but villages vary quite a lot by the number of households that live there. So in some sense, the per person or per household treatment uh, varied quite a lot, and we exploit that uh, to be able to back out the, the impact of this financial innovation. Uh, and investment actually does go up. There's investment in agricultural activities, uh, in repair of uh, vehicles that are used for tra by traders as a, as a source of income, uh, although other things happened as well. Consumption also goes up, uh, arguably because they now have a reliable source of borrowing and they don't need to have as many buffer stocks around to uh, squirrel away for I would say for the rainy day, but it's really the, the drought day. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so uh, there's an instance where, you know, something like microcredit uh, could be assessed uh, without all the, the politics that comes with it, and it, it, it looks on net as if uh, it was helpful. Um, now, that said, you know, there are alternative ways to, to give away money other than uh, establishing a financial institution. So uh, the real winners in this were households who were constrained in the amount of investment that they could do, uh, and, and other households would have preferred to just take a lump sum grant. It would have had the same consequences for the government budget, of course, Nowhere in what I said did we refer to the losses of the people who pay the taxes to fund this government program, but uh, but at least it does allow us to answer your question about the the impact of microcredit and and other financial innovations. Let me go back to the example you mentioned earlier of the households that had very high rates of return on uh, on their assets in say forty to fifty percent range, and I've read that there are for-profit financial institutions in poor countries that can charge rates higher than that even and generate profit from people who are credit-constrained, who have opportunities to pay that high and are willing to then borrow the money at high rates. Um, isn't that suggestive or is it not that, 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 that a better financial system would lead to big increases, not modest increases, but – big increases in well-being. Yes, that's quite true. And so what do we think is stopping people from 
exploiting that either on the borrowings in the good sense of the word, either on the borrowing or the lending side, right? So you you've got somebody who's got an asset that's returning fifty percent a year. They'd like to have twice as much of it. Maybe the rate would fall to forty if they had twice as much. But somebody could lend them money and make twenty percent, thirty percent, huge returns, lending them the money. The people who would borrow that money to expand their their assets, whether they're farm equipment or whatever else we're talking about, would, would, would thrive. There appears to be very large unexploited gains from trade there. What, what, any, do we have any insight into the mystery? Uh, some. Let me just throw in a, 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 you know, one, one comment, which is it's not as though the households necessarily just sit there doing nothing about the possibility of getting of doing better. In fact, the strongest evidence that we're getting the numbers right is that these households with very high rates of return do uh, take the money that they earn and put it back in the business. Their savings rates are higher. They will even drop consumption in order to sure. try to, to get yet more resources to put in the business. Um, Using yourself they, as a you bank. Don't, you don't see this catch-up happening very quickly because they have a long way to go. I mean, it is true. One wonders how quickly the gains would fall off, you know, as in, a, say, a solo model. Eventually, with diminishing returns, you, you get to a steady state. These households seem very far away from a steady state, even though they've some of them have been investing in their own business. Well, to come back to your question, um, the uh, I think part of the problem is that that these things are not uh, well understood and that that people have priors one way or the other. <laughs> uh, microfinance in India is in big trouble right now. Why? Uh, 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 my take on it is that, ironically, some of the microfinance institutions, as you were suggesting, are were making a lot of money. They start as not-for-profits. Uh, in Mexico, some of them start as uh, religious organizations. Uh, but eventually, uh, the, the, more, the, the more successful ones privatize. They, uh, they have IPOs, and the owners make tons of money. Um, and then in Mexico, there's an investigation from the Congress, and in India, this hit the press. And it... it, it fed into this preconception that people are making money on the backs of the poor and that this is this is evil uh, and microfinance is supposed to be helpful, not supposed to be profit-oriented. It gave a rebirth to the controversy that existed at the very beginning. Uh, ironically, at the very beginning, people questioned whether microfinance institutions could actually make profit. You know, setting aside whether they ought to. Right. The claim being, I, I guess, that the lenders wouldn't pay the money back. Uh, they'd just take advantage of it, and then they'd, the nest egg would be gone, and they'd have to start over, right? That was the original worry. Well, or that these households didn't understand what they were doing, and yep. they were going to be over-indebted. Yep. And uh, uh, their life would be miserable and so on. Uh, that's not the picture, by the way, that, of course, that I'm painting, which is largely households with fairly low levels of debt and and insufficient funds for some of them to take advantage of profitable opportunities. So in India, uh, about a month or so after the banner headlines of how one of these microfinance institutions had made so much money, there was uh, another series of articles that over-indebted households in Andhra Pradesh had no place to go and had committed suicide. And and this was quickly uh, picked up and spread, and the, the provincial government, the state, I guess, in Mah- uh, Andhra Pradesh, issued a moratorium on repayment of loans, so that, um, which des- basically destroys the culture of repayment. Yeah, it's a problem. And and they this is it happened uh, a couple of years ago in a small way and now uh, in 
November of this year and so on in a in a very big way um, that affects the flow of funds because to India and on into these microfinance institutions outside investors are going to be leery of getting their money back so venture capital money has been drying up the the Royal Bank of India now realizes the problem and is trying to set up a, some kind of insurance pool to to keep things going but in many respects the a lot of damage has been done yeah. so not all countries are like india of course but the these sort of conceptions and misconceptions of uh mixed in with you know politics have often been a barrier to innovation coming back to my earlier question about growth uh, and the role of finance has this earlier success of microfinance in india been important in India's growth, or do you think it's merely just a? I shouldn't say merely just, but or is it only uh, a smoothing an insurance scheme? I don't know for India. I know there's a potential there. Uh, there have been evaluations of some microfinance uh, 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 lending. My colleagues. Uh, Banerjee and Duflo have done this in Hyderabad, and uh, again, it's it's not a resounding success for all the borrowers. So many people don't borrow at all, and uh, those that that do sometimes use it for consumption, which in my mind is fine. Uh, but you you can find this sort of subset of the population of entrepreneurs who either set up a business or expand their business. And um, and I guess it's important to repeat that that's like my tie data. It's not all these households. It's just a subset. Now, for India, I don't know what the impact is of this spread. For Thailand, we've actually built economic models based on these uh, data and have simulated uh, the experience over the last 30 years with the the spread of financial institutions, not so much microfinance institutions. Thailand actually doesn't have very many of those apart from these village funds, but uh, the spread of uh, a government bank for agriculture, for example. Uh, and we can actually explain about 75% of the movement in macro total factor productivity with this deepening of the financial system. What is that explain that phrase because it, it what does it mean to deepen the financial system? What do you have what do you mean by that? Deepening the financial system means that there are more branches of banks, there are more uh borrowers as well as uh savers and it's oh this, so this this is like that extensive margin we referred to earlier, where you were saying uh, some households don't work or only work at home, and then they go into the wage labor market. Well, in this case, some households don't uh, engage with formal sector financial institutions, at least not at first. But then eventually, many of them make that transition. Uh, so if you go to a cross-sectional data set that the Thai government has been collecting since 1976. They fortunately asked a question, noisy but uh, but useful question, which is, did you have a transaction with this bank for agriculture or with a commercial bank in the previous month? Back in 1976, basically only uh, 7 or 8 percent of the households ans- answered the question affirmatively. Uh, but over the years, between 76 and, say, uh, 96, a period of very high growth for Thailand, uh, that number rises by threefold. Wow. So that's what I mean by financial deepening on the extensive margin. I guess TFP, or total factor productivity, is probably better understood, but just to to review it, it's it's, it's the amount of output that you can... Uh, produce both taking into account land, labor, and capital uh, 
but also sort of a productivity term in the aggregated production function. And that productivity term holding resources constant moves around quite a bit. And in advanced industrialized economies, a lot of the growth is associated with productivity growth and not with changes of the factors. But that's likewise true for an emerging market country like Thailand. Uh, total factor productivity is high but moving around, and we've been able to determine that the movements in it are very highly correlated with this financial deepening. I mean, it, it makes sense uh, because it's not creating more factors of production. It's, it's reallocating them. It's taking money through lending and interest-bearing deposits from those inefficient households who shouldn't be running their own farm and business and channeling it through credit to, to those that should. So nothing's changed about land, labor, or capital. What's really changed is the intermediation. And then the, the lenders, the savers, get to share some of those gains. That's right. They're, they're induced. in principle can, yeah. can benefit from this. So let me just take a side route here for a minute uh, to the United States, and then I'm, let's get into Thailand in more detail. But first, a question about the United States. My claim is that uh, through policy errors uh, and some stupidity, but aided by a lot of policy errors, our highly vaunted and developed financial system managed to channel trillions of dollars into housing over the last 10, 15 years. A decision that, I mean, we think of the financial system as key for allocating capital, the story you just told, and people on Wall Street will constantly tell you that they play a crucial role in, in our standard of living and our productivity because the allocation of capital is clearly a hugely important issue. But I would suggest that in recent years we've misallocated capital rather remarkably in the United States. Do you think that's true? Yes, I do think it's true, and I agree with the the example of housing. I think, you know, for well-intended reasons perhaps uh, – both through Democratic and Republican administrations, housing has been thought to be uh, uh, some not exactly a right, but it would be a good thing if many more people and low-income people could could own their own home. Um, so I think that creates incentives for local and national uh, at the federal level to create institutions and programs to try to make that that dream come true, and clearly, just to you know, speak to the obvious. Uh, uh, in the latest round, there were many people who really weren't qualified to to borrow money who who had mortgages and got into homes, uh, and the construction that you know that went along with it, like mushrooms sprouting all over these these uh, suburban complexes and or rural areas with fields, basically just getting filled in with these housing developments. It's, it was really quite remarkable. It, 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 if anything, amazing that that it, people didn't put two and two together earlier. But as I said, that's really that's really hindsight. Some people so did, of course. I'm not arguing not that um, financial systems inevitably do, do well. They can certainly go off track, and uh, it's important to be clear about how they function. It's important to in my mind, rate uh, financial institutions in terms of the services they're providing using, for example, these very same benchmarks I was I was referring to earlier. It takes data and the, and the political will to do it. Yeah, I, I mentioned the, the U.S. because uh, so often people measure the cost of the some intervention or another as what it costs the taxpayers. Um, in our case, I think. It's going to cost us hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe trillions, but the the unseen cost, that's transfer mostly. The unseen cost is the misallocation of scarce capital and how – what we don't have because we built so many and so much, such bigger houses. Let, let's turn to Thailand. Now, Thailand, as you say, has been growing dramatically for – since, what, three decades, um, interrupted by – the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s, but now 
they're doing well again, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, the growth rate never got up to the, you know, 5 6% uh, on average that it was uh, prior. So there's kind of like a shift uh, in, in terms of the long-run averages, but uh, they're still the envy of many countries in the world. Uh, I mean, for them, it's a bad year when the, the growth rate is below 4%, and that's still the case, that, that their growth rate is, is typically higher than that. Uh, they've had other problems, too. You know, the tsunami, they have a political crisis ongoing, um, but somehow they weather these storms and manage to continue to, to produce fairly high rates of growth. And the United States... There's a claim out there that I don't agree with, but there's a claim that average income per capita income in the United States has grown dramatically in the last three to four decades, but supposedly most or all of it's gone to the top 1%. Sometimes you hear the top 20%, top 5%, top 10 And I argued earlier and I've argued elsewhere that some of that's a distortion of the data because – uh, it's not the same people, and it's very misleading. There's been demographic changes that distort, et cetera, et cetera. But in your case, in Thailand, you've got household data of of a substantial size to look at what's happened to people's lives. So in Thailand, during this period when growth is four to four plus percent year in year out, which doubles by the rule of seventy two, you know, every eighteen years you're going to double income at that rate double things yeah. at 4%. And when you can get 6%, you double every 12, which is unbelievable. Um, has, they had some 10% years in there. Often yeah, that in is. which case you double every seven years. Uh, and it's actually the rule of 70, more than 72, but more things go into 72. And for those of you who don't know the rule, basically you divide the growth rate into 72, and that tells you how many periods it takes for the, for the number to double. Um, so... Has a rising tide in Thailand lifted all boats, most boats, some boats? What What does your panel data tell us? So at first, inequality was increasing. The, uh, the wage rates were kind of staying low, basically pinned down by the return in subsistence agriculture without a whole lot of technological progress in agriculture while the country was industrializing. So... This was a source of great profits, uh, which got, uh, for business, which got reinvested. But eventually, you see this, this increasing level of capital, uh, increasing the productivity of labor, which around 1992, 1994 made its way into wages. Uh, and then the, the picture just basically reversed itself rather dramatically. Inequality started to drop and drop substantially. It via, is a bit like the rising really, tide raising boats. So these are households who are benefiting indirectly from the industrialization through through higher wages. And it, uh, is this an urban? There, there world? was a bit of a of a back step in the financial crisis. Uh, inequality went up again, uh, pretty sharply for a year or two, but then relatively quickly it fell back down and is now lower than it was, uh, I think, prior. To 1997. Is this an, a rural urban transition? When you, when you talk about the industrialization, are these people leave? Is this a case where people are leaving farming and coming to factories? Somewhat, yeah. The 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 number of people who are say earning wages is going up. It's become the single la- largest category of people. Whereas if you go back to 1960, say it's. Uh, Farm and non-farm self-employment it would be the largest category. Um, surprising to many people, corporate profits still are not the biggest source of income in the in the national accounts. Uh, profits are maybe 22 percent of of all household income, uh, whereas some of these other numbers are 40 or 50 percent. Uh, but but I would dispel the image of lots of poor farmers migrating to the Bangkok. That has happened uh, to a large degree. It's a big part of the story, but it's not the only story. There's a lot of development going on in the regions. You're seeing uh, 
collections of villages grow uh, with construction to the point that they have become towns, not villages at all. In our data, we gather soil moisture and have readers out there in the fields where those fields got paved over with highways and we lost our lost ability data to points. measure. Uh, but the, it's really a, a kind of a startling indicator of the urbanization that's going on, not just in Bangkok, but in but in the regions. Uh, and and small business plays a very big low. I know we're going back again, circling back again to the things that we talked about before, but, but uh, it's still the case that a large chunk of national income is coming from uh, these hundreds of thousands of small household businesses, often without hired labor, that, that make money and when added up, uh, contribute a substantial chunk. And, and they have been expanding as well. Not everywhere, not uniformly, but, but red hotspots, areas of uh, agglomerate agglomeration, particularly in the in the rural areas. Give me some examples of what's going on in those small self-employed businesses. A lot of it is truck barter and exchange. You know, you'll you'll buy a pickup truck, which is of course not a small expense. Um, you know, you could easily spend thirty, forty thousand US dollars on on a vehicle, which, you know, is a tribute to their previous savings that they have that available to them. Uh, and then they'll haul stuff around, you know, buy and sell. That's perhaps the most common business in the, in the data. Being, um, a, being a middleman. Yeah. Helping others make transactions more cheaply that they would otherwise struggle to make, I guess. Yes. I'm yes, just, I'm just thinking fair. about... I'm thinking about Adam Smith. I'm thinking about not the truck bartered exchange, which is a Adam Smith reference, but I'm thinking about the pin factory uh, and specialization in general. So you have a population that maybe in 1960 was relatively self-sufficient. A lot of people were self-sufficient. They were on farms. Now they're integrating themselves into a economy that is more sp- has more divisional labor, more specialization, and, and more trade. Is that an accurate picture? Yes. It's, uh, part of it is, is not that you're learning to create pins better, though. It's just, um, as, say, transportation costs fall, as the financial system improves, you get these predictions that people will, for, for inter-regional trade that people are more used to thinking about in terms of inter-country trade, like Portugal and England, you know, with wine and, and wool. Uh, so these rural areas were basically relatively labor uh, uh, abundant and had low wages, and near and around Bangkok, their uh, labor was relatively scarce and capital was abundant. So you see divergence in, you know, interest rates and wages, depending on the most common thing around. But over time, as the country opens up, you, you get these predictions that, uh, you know, the, the wage starts to rise in the rural area as effectively they're exporting labor-intensive goods uh, to Bangkok and to the rest of the country. Uh, so you, you're getting sort of the gains to trade happening, but not all at once, because the infrastructure doesn't improve quickly yeah. uh, all, of, all of a sudden. It, it improves gradually, yeah. So what have we learned anything? I'm, I'm going to ask two questions. Have, have we learned anything from Thailand in particular? And also, your bird's eye view, the fact that you're looking at households per se rather than aggregate data only, what might we learn from those two, ph- two phenomena that might help other countries get close to that four plus percent growth rate or five plus, et cetera. Well, I think you want to facilitate learn? transitions uh, into the financial system, changing occupation, getting the kids educated, um, but not necessarily, you know, do it by giving money away, just by improving the markets and the and the institutions that are that are there that's kind of that 
that's layered on top of a country where households are very entrepreneurial. They're very successful, um, some of them. So they don't sit around unemployed, rarely. Even in the financial crisis, uh, households set up businesses, uh, some of them with low rates of return, but still they're employed they're doing, doing that and earning more money than they would be if they were uh, just returning to the village to, to sit around unemployed. This is something we can see in my data, comparing the sort of pre-financial crisis business to the post-financial crisis businesses. Um, so perhaps, you know, this this entrepreneurship varies, you know, culturally. I, I, I just, that's not kind of uh, my relative expertise. I... I look at how cultures create local institutions that can help mitigate these problems. These these kinship networks, for example, um, are quite lively and, and robust and have been helpful on some, if not all, of the dimensions. Uh, so some lessons, I think, are we we need to understand what's going on on the ground uh, before we jump to conclusions. To touch on some of the things we've already, you know, covered, the notion that somehow money lending is evil, um, and uh, Thailand, unfortunately, has taken the route of trying to replace local money lenders with uh, sources of cheap credit. Uh, that, in my mind, is probably a very big mistake. Not only are, is the cheap credit not sustainable, but they're undercutting these these local financial systems. Uh, again, you can kind of think it's a bit provocative to draw some par- parallels with the U.S. These sort of informal financial markets in Thailand are, by and large, quite helpful. Uh, it's not uniform. It doesn't work everywhere. It's not true in every village, but by and large, helpful. Whereas in the U.S., we seem to be going in the direction of stifling financial innovation. This is a tricky business. Uh, We have to sort of get to the bottom of where the distortions were without uh, adopting policies that really dealt with the symptoms and not the underlying disease. So, uh, you know, a policy of thwarting the informal financial market, which in some instances all these households have going for them, is, you know, arguably a a bad policy, at least in Thailand. And it gives me pause when I think about um, over-labeling financial institutions in the sense of sort of drawing a, a plan and saying this kind of institution should be doing X and another kind of institution can be doing Y, you could, if they cannot then coordinate with one another in some way, you can definitely uh, cause some problems. Or as F.A. Hayek said, the curious task of economics is to illustrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. <laughs> and it's, um, you well, know, there's, I'm thinking about... I'm cons- having a lot of fun... Uh, I enjoy what I do quite a lot, and and I and I really it, there is kind of a sense of discovery when you have the data I have. We can actually look and see what's what's going on. It's it's kind of never enough, of course. One always wishes one had more, but uh, but I really think many countries would be much better off if if they not only had these kinds of data, but they had the frameworks. Uh, so that they can interpret them and and base you know base policy on on the conclusions of the analysis. Well, we're almost out of time. Let me ask you one more question, a sort of tricky one. Um, we've gone through a couple of of changes in the United States and in response to the crisis, which I couldn't help thinking of in your. Make, you're making your last comment. I was thinking about consumer protection. Often attempts to protect consu- consumers will make them worse off if it's done poorly. And I think there's a tendency among some folks to assume that policy is always designed with the best of intentions. Um, 
and that when things go wrong, there are unintended consequences. That's part of life. I tend to think that there are fewer unintended consequences than people think, that a lot of consequences are intended. And in the United States, the financial sector is pretty politically savvy. Not pretty. It's extremely savvy and extremely powerful. Not only does it give money, but I think it just has access is what I've been um, thinking about lately. Uh, recent conversation with your colleague Darren Asimoglu, this came up. Um, in other in these developing countries, what are some of the political forces that inhibit or help uh, good policy with respect to financial systems? Oh, it's, in many countries, you know, the, the banking system is is rather thin. I mean, if you if you count the the um, the top five, say, banks in Mexico, they they pretty much account for all of it. Um, and likewise, um, you know, maybe per se that's not convincing, but then you do sort of a conventional financial access survey and discover, at least you would have discovered five years ago, you know, large sectors of the Mexican population without uh, use of, of uh, savings and and other financial services. So I kind of agree with where you're going with this. One really has to look at hard at the barriers. You know, what is it that's, that's preventing, um, innovation in the, in the financial system? I guess we referred to this a bit earlier. You, you can see it happen with microfinance institutions and all of a sudden when they're successful, you get these congressional investigations and so on. Um, so is that well intended or is it in fact because there are losers? Yeah. And, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't discount the fact that, um, that in many of these countries, you know, banks are essentially making, uh, money and they have very little incentive to, um, to innovate. I mean, I, I guess in Thailand, we are, we are working with the government to, uh, to try to improve the financial system. Uh, but often uh, some of the work involved in doing that is just getting the facts out there, summarizing uh, the data. And um, uh, if banks don't have an incentive to innovate, then if you bring up a, a case study from an area they, do, they don't service, they're inevitably going to regard it as very risky and and not do it. The, I think the tricky thing here is that we shouldn't be in the business of telling every institution they ought to, what they ought to do and that they off, ought to offer a certain array of services. But if, if there are gains to making pins and specialization in banking, uh, then we just have to make sure the rest of the system is open so that somebody else can can step in and, and innovate. It's, it's a very slippery slope. The finance companies in Thailand were relatively unregulated, unlike the commercial banks, and they were the culprit. You know, they, they essentially were feeding that, uh, housing bubble, uh, that broke and created in Thailand and then the rest of Asia that, that, that financial crisis. So, um, I, I guess my heartfelt, you know, agenda is to have enough data and enough frameworks to be able to really assess, uh, the flow of funds and rates of return and, and, uh, call a spade a spade institution by institution. My guest today has been Robert Townsend. Rob, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.